Welcome to the Growing Pulses in 2020 webinar on pre-emergent herbicides. My name is Claire and I work with the Birchip Cropping Group. I coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability. The purpose of today's webinar is to give, you a new, to give new and existing pulse growers an update on pre-emergent herbicide options, where they have a fit and their strengths and weaknesses. Now, before we start the webinar, everybody should be muted. We will take questions after the presentation and the Q&A button window at the bottom of your screen allows you to ask questions. So if you see that button, click that, open the window, type your question into the box and hit send. You can also check send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to your question. This webinar is also being recorded. So if you can't stay for the whole thing, or if you have technical issues or you would like to share this, you can do so later. Now let's get straight into today's presentation. I'd like to introduce you all to Tony Craddock from Rural Directions and David Keach from New Farm. Tony's an agronomic consultant with Rural Directions based at Freeling in SA Lower North Cropping, but provides advice to cropping clients situated in the South Australian Mallee, Upper Southeast, Lower Mid North and York Peninsula. Tony is also a member of the steering committee of GRDC's Southern Pulse Extension Project and facilitates a pulse check group in Manham in South Australia's Murray Mallee. David is a field development officer for New Farm, conducting research, product development and extension trials in South Australia. Several years of experience performing pre-emergent herbicide trials in South Australia on soil, different soil types. So I'll hand straight over to Tony and David. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. I'm uh, Tony Craddock. I'm on first cab off the rank. I'll get you to go to the title page there, Claire. Look, my job today is to go through the old chemistry associated with uh, pre-emergence in pulses. And David's going to do the sexy new stuff uh, uh, after I've finished talking about the, the, older, the older chemistry. So I'm going to work through a, a lot of the, the stuff that's already registered, uh, has been registered for quite a while in pulses. I'm not going to do a blow by blow, but I just want to raise a few points on, on each as we go through that I've learnt or, or uh, experienced in, in, uh, in my time as an agronomist. Uh, now, a couple of things. One thing in the presentation is I've listed label rates on a lot of these products. In reality, the actual use rates in different areas and different soil types will vary considerably from the label. And in many cases, those label rates, well, the, the use rates in different areas are considerably lower than the label rates, particularly in sandier, low organic matter soils. And I stress that if you, you need to get some local advice on appropriate rates for your area and your soil types, because there are situations where the label rates will absolutely smoke crops. So just keep that in mind, they're label rates and label rates are not necessarily appropriate in every, every situation. Claire, can I take you to the first, um, first slide, please? Okay, just a quick step through the pre-emergent uh, herbicides for grasses in pulses. Everyone's aware of trifluralin. It's been around 30, 40 years, I don't know. And uh, it's, it's registered on a wide range of pulse crops. Probably the only point here that I'd like to make is that there's considerable resistance uh, in ryegrass to, to trifluralin in a lot of areas, including the Big North and YP. Um, in the Mallee, we seem to still be getting quite good results out of trifluralin grasses, and, uh, and, it's, and it's certainly still quite useful. In pulses, just be aware that, um, that lentils are a little bit more sensitive to trifluralin than other, other crops. We certainly saw problems in the past when we were running prickle chains and uh, covering harrows after applying trifluralin and then sowing lentils. And uh, rates of above one, one litre per hectare can cause some, some issues uh, if the trifluralin ends up in the seed row. 
more recently, or it's been a few years now, we've moved to propizamide, which is another group, group D. It's now registered in a range of pulse crops. And the best part about propizamide is it offers ryegrass control or suppression, and there is no known resistance in broadacre cropping situations as yet. Label rates between 560 grams and 1.1 kilos. But just be aware of those high usage rates that there are plant back issues or can be plant back issues for cereals the following year. And from my perspective, I tend to use uh, around the, the 560 gram rate of a 900 gram per litre, uh, 900 gram per kilo product as, as my ceiling. You'll also notice in more recent years that Box of Gold has been registered for use in pulses um, as a pre-emergent. My question is, is uh, why, why would we use it? Well, we've got propizamide and uh, I'd probably be saving the Box of Gold up for, for my cereals in the rotation rather than, rather than using it on the pulses, but it is an option. Another thing I just wanted to point out before we move on is the, the colour of, uh, of the text um, you'll see a little key down the bottom there. Green means that uh, that it's uh, it's there's quite a good level of safety of this product at this particular rate for for that um, when it detects is in green. Yellow is caution, and red is uh, you know, beware. This could be potentially damaging. So you'll see these colours are through my presentation, and that's a bit of an explanation on what they mean. Next slide, thanks, Claire. All right, I'm going to start with the cheap and cheerful group C's. Again, these uh, chemicals have been around for ages, even before I was even an agronomist. So diuron is, uh, is registered on a range of pulse crops. The label use rates range from 830 grams to 1.1 kilos of a 900 gram per kilo product. And it offers general brassica and cape weed control. In the Mallee, we'll be using half that, uh, that 830 gram rate because anything over that, it uh, creates some safety issues for the, for the crop. Another old faithful is Simazine, uh, quite safe on beans and lupins in general. A bit touchier on, on, uh, on chickpeas, but it is registered in chickpeas. And you'll see that there are different rates on the label according that the rate relate to the different torrents of those pulse crops on uh, to, to actual simazine. And simazine offers general brassica and cape weed control. It is effective to a certain extent on prickly lettuce and sow thistle, but we'll talk about that a bit more later and does offer some silver grass suppression as well. Next slide, thanks Claire. Okay, a step up, a step up in control. Sometimes it's a bit of a step up in price, but um, metribuzin is widely used on, uh, on a range of pulse crops. I've got lentils and vetch in yellow in that we have to be a little bit careful about, uh, about rates. You can damage, damage those crops with, with inappropriate rates of metribuzin on inappropriate soil types. It's also registered in peas, post-emergent up to three nodes and a lot of agronomists will be aware of that one and you'll see a rate range on the label ranging from 180 grams in sandier soil types to 380 grams in, in the heavier soil types. A range of, uh, range of weed control but I guess the difference is that, um, that in the mid-north we tend to use it for a bit of medic suppression and it also can offer you a bit of biophora suppression, but I must admit that the suppression on both those weeds is much better at higher rates and much better uh, when it's used post-emergent rather than pre-emergent. Be careful on lighter soils because it's quite a soluble product and there are varietal tolerance differences. Hurricane and also Hallmark lentils are more sensitive to metribuzin and Zara beans are also, also a bit more sensitive to, uh, to metribuzin. So be, be careful with those varieties. The next step up is Turbine Extreme or Turbazine 875. Now I refer to this particular product as a, as a, as a souped up simazine. It's, um, it's Simazine Plus. So registered on lentils, chickpeas, beans, peas, vetch and lupins, so quite a range of, of crops. What, um, what I will say is be very careful with lentils and vetch, um, particularly on, uh, on grey mallee loans and sandy soils, because you can, at label rates, cause quite a bit of damage to those, those crops in the wrong soil types. Its claim to fame, or its use pattern for, for me, is it's very good on brassicas and cakeweed, does offer some prickly lettuce and, uh, and, and uh, sow thistle control, 
but it does offer reasonable medic control as well. So we're dealing with medics as a weed, particularly burr and to a less extent barrel medic. It does a reasonable job of suppressing, suppressing those weeds. But uh, main point is, it's a great product, but be very careful about uh, using it on lentils in those uh, grey mallee loams and sands. Next slide, thanks, Claire. Okay, then we've got the special cases. Spinnaker is uh, a group B herbicide. It's an IMI herbicide and it's registered on chickpeas, IMI tolerant lentils, not normal lentils, beans and peas, uh, all IBS. It's also registered post immersion on peas and uh, IMI tolerant lentils. So use rates depend on the crop, but 70 to 100 grams on peas and immune tolerant lentils and, uh, and also beans. Um, chickpeas, you'll see on the label, 45 grams of spinnaker plus a, a, a lower rate of simazine as a mixed partner. So where would you use it? We use it uh, where we've got radish that is actually group B susceptible. Not, obviously it's a group B herbicide. So if you've got group B resistance, it's not gonna work very well. But also we use it quite a bit in trying to suppress Bifora, bed straw, maybe speedwell and yellow burrweed in pulses as well. So it offers a bit more than your simazines, turbines, those sorts of things in those, with those, uh, those what I'll call odd bod sorts of weeds. Beware plant backs, being an IMI, it's, uh, it does have some plant back requirements, particularly for non IMI tolerant cereals the next year. And you'll find that it's 300 mils of rainfall between application and growing a non IMI tolerant cereal. So be careful. Uh, and then the other special case is Balance, which is a chickpea only herbicide. And we tend to use it at, uh, at 80 grams or thereabouts in a mixture with, with Simazine uh, pre emergent. Or more recently, we've been using it with a lower rate of uh, lower rate of um, tur turbine as well. And its claim to fame is not only does it offer brassica, cape weed, and uh, uh, and some prickly lettuce and south thistle control, but again, it's pretty good on suppressing medic and gets used in chickpeas for that reason. Next slide, thanks, Claire. Okay, look been stressing all the way through safety is an issue with pre-emergent herbicides particularly the group C's and here's a few of my tips for for maintaining some degree of safety or trying to reduce the damage effect and you, what we don't want to see is what we got in the in the picture there it's a picture of uh, um, metribuzin touching up some lentils and a uh, pretty common sight in uh, uh, in in some years so first thing is the, use the correct product and the correct rate for the crop and soil type. And as I said before, seek some local advice. Talk to some exper experienced agronomists in your area, but also experienced growers as well to try and get the rate right for the soil type. Watch the active ingredient. The, these products differ in formulations and it can get quite, inf quite confusing. When Turbine Extreme came in at 875 grams per kilo and uh, largely replaced a lot of the Turbine 750 gram per kilo, we had a lot of touch up of lentil crops where people forgot or neglected to change the rate. So it's pretty simple, but be careful about the formulation that you've been supplied or, or, uh, or you've sourced. Uh, granular simazine versus the liquids. The granulars are stronger, you know, gram, gram per, per litre, a gram per, gram per kilo. And propizomide differs in formulation as well. I've had quite a few clients that have gone it. We've looked at the 500 gram per kilo or 500 gram per litre rate. They put out a 900 gram per kilo product at the same rate. And we've had to dodge some, some, um, some um, uh, residue issues for the following, following year. Sowing deep is one thing you can do to, um, to increase herbicide safety. So 40 to 50 millimetres in, in pulses other than lupins is, is a way of achieving some extra safety. And always IBS is much safer than PSPE. And you'll see often on the labels, there's a, there's a difference in the rates recommended or listed for PSPE versus IBS. So I tend to be an IBS user where I can because it's, because it's safer. Managing soil throw is very important. So not going too fast, giving your, your row spacing, trying to minimize that throw of herbicide laden soil into the row next door. And beware prickle chains and finger tie and harrows. You know, I've had growers 
that uh, with all good good, uh, good intentions, we've they've uh, they've gone gone over and run over their their uh, newly sown lentil crop with a prickle chain um, at, to smooth out some hay, and some straw lumps, and inadvertently rake the the, uh, the pre-emergent herbicide into the rows and cause damage. So just keep in mind that uh, that we're trying to keep these herbicides separate to the seed to maintain some, some safety. Also beware dry soils. If you put these herbicides onto a dry soil and get a decent rain, these her a lot of these herbicides follow the wetting front down through the soil, can end up in the seed zone and cause, cause problems. Um, and keep in mind too that disc seeders have increased risk as well. Um, and I see the question popping up about dry sowing. Yeah, dry sowing, be very careful with these group C's. Uh, either bring the rates back, choose the, modify your, your product according to, uh, according to its, uh, its solubility, uh, product choice according to the solubility, try and, or even leave them off if it's, if it's a, a highly dangerous soil. Next slide, thanks Claire. Okay, talked about solubility. These products, particularly the group C's, vary in their solubility, and they will uh, they they and it it's a bit of an indicator of the risk of using these products in dry uh, dry soils or in a dry sowing situation. So you'll see there down the list there you've got um, on the bottom of the list you've got metribuzin. So metribuzin is a, is quite a bit more soluble than the other group C products. Diuron's middle of the range. Simazine and turbine are, are low solubility. So, if you're going to have a problem in a dry sowing situation or a or a sandy soil situation, it's more likely to be metribuzin. Next slide, thanks, Claire. Okay, I've been asked to just make a mention of control of prickly lettuce, or if you're in Victoria, whip thistle, and I've grabbed this data from Penny Roberts at Sardi. Now. To, to just illustrate a few points about controlling uh, herbicidal control of these, these weeds. Now these, this data comes out of some of the work that Sadi has done on group C tolerant lentil germplasm. So this is lentils that have been bred particular, in particular for resistance to group C's. So the rates that you're seeing, some of the rates you're seeing here just never go there with lentils. It's for illustration purposes only. So, okay, let's move, move through it. So if you look at Met the second bar from the left, metribuzin at 180 grams. Thanks, Claire, very good mouse work there. Metribuzin 180 grams does achieve a level of prickly lettuce control. So it's, it's, um, it's reduced the prickly lettuce from five, five plants per square metre down to two plants per square metre. But as you, and also if you go to the far right, turbine, and this is turbine 750, not the 875, which is the, this is the top label rate of turbine, does offer fairly, fairly reasonable control of, um, well, even better control of whip thistle compared to, to 180, 180 grams of, uh, of metribuzin. But you see on these, these metribuzin tolerant lentils, where you start lifting rates to 360 or seven, 720 grams, you get very, very good control of, uh, of prickly lettuce. Now, so that's, this creates a quandary. We, if with pulses, we do have group, uh, we do have uh, group C herbicides that are effective on prickly lettuce, but the trouble with these weeds is they have a staggered and prolonged germination. These things often germinate in, in August and also September when these pre-emergent herbicides have effectively run out of legs. So, so we do get early control with these products, but they run out of legs and we get some late germinators. Now, I will draw your attention to bar number three from the left, the metribuzin, post sowing pre-emergent, plus followed up by with 200 mils of uh, diflufenican or brodal post-emergence. So that has achieved very good control. Brodal does have effectiveness on, on prickly lettuce. So the two-step approach when, when the metribuzin has potentially run out of legs, the diflufenican has done quite a good job of, uh, of controlling some late germinators. So yes, we get control. But uh, with the pre-emergent uh, group C's, they do run out of legs. And the two-stage approach uh, with prickly lettuce any anyway with follow-up brodal does do a better job. Next slide, thanks, Claire. 
same sort of same rates of herbicide with sow thistle. But in this case, you'll notice that, um, that the diflufenic and follow up, the third bar from the left, hasn't been as effective. So diflufenicin is not as effective on, uh, on sow thistle or provides not a great deal of control of sow thistle. So we're just really relying on the pre-emergent group Bs. So as you can see, there was no, no benefit from including the, uh, the, the diflufenicin on, on, um, on sow thistle in this particular case. But what you will see is that the pre-emergent uh, group Cs the metribuzin at 100 grams and the turbine at uh, 1.4 litres has given us a degree of sow thistle control, but the late germinators have brought us unstuck again. Next slide, thanks, Claire. Okay, that brings my the old chemistry to an, to an end. I'm gonna hand over to David now to talk about the, uh, the new stuff and the really interesting stuff. So over to you, David. Thanks, Tony. Um... Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, I'll briefly touch on, uh, I guess, Group G residual herbicides uh, in the pulse space. And typically, we know and use Group G herbicides as knockdown spikes. And now we're seeing the emergence of um, Group G active ingredients being used as residual herbicides. So I'll talk about why that's useful and um, touch on a couple of the products in this space. Next slide, please, Claire. So... Currently on the market, um, Terrain uh, is registered in barber beans, chickpeas and field peas. Uh, this active ingredient is flumioxazin. It's a simple and easy use rate. It's 180 grams IBS. Um, and it can, and it is recommended that it's applied with uh, other herbicides, so triazines, uh, spinnaker, balance, and other residual grass herbicides. It's, it's immobile, so it will stick to stubble, but it basically creates a barrier at the soil surface um, and uh, kills weeds as they emerge. The other one is, is Reflex. Uh, this is a Syngenta product and, and will be available next year. So this active ingredient is Fomasafen. Uh, it'll be registered in barber beans, chickpeas, field peas, vetch and lupin, IBS or PSPE and lentils IBS. Um, so this one has flexible use rates. For instance, it'll be 500 mils to 1.5 litres IBS um, in those above pulses and 500 mils to one litre IBS in lentils. Um, again, this can be applied with triazine herbicides, grass herbicides, spinnaker balance, and, and it has more mobility um, than flumioxazin. Uh, next slide, please, Claire. So, so why would we use uh, group G residual herbicides. As I mentioned, we typically think of group Gs as knockdown spikes. And in a way, these are uh, very powerful residual spikes. And they are providing an alternate mode of action for broadleaf weed control. You know, we have no known resistance in broadacre cropping situations to, to group G herbicides. Um, they also enhance the weed spectrum. So particularly when there is a high weed burden, they are useful as uh, and excellent mix partners in this situation, but also for broadening the weed spectrum. And Tony touched on um, some tricky weeds that um, Group Cs, for instance, have trouble controlling like bed straw by four. So uh, these provide ex excellent mi mix partners for weed spectrum and weed burden. Um, they also have favorable characteristics around crop safety. And what I mean by that is, is we can't double the rate of terbithylazine, for instance, to, to get better weed control because we know we get unacceptable crop damage. So um, what we can do is we can increase the herbicide load by adding the group G residual um, and improve weed control without compromising crop safety. So they're improving that herbicide load. Um, they also have significantly less plant back restrictions compared to Imi's herbicides. And I know there's a lot of uh, IMI tolerant crops, uh, pulse crops coming online now, and it's a very useful use pattern. But for those looking to get away from using IMI herbicides, uh, the Group Gs provide a, an additional mode of action um, for controlling weeds. Uh, while not on the label of terrain and reflex, we know that the Group Gs um, in this residual space do have activity on annual ryegrass, and so they complement something like propizomide to to provide additional activity. Uh, next slide, please, Claire. So we did want to focus a little bit on 
uh, milk thistle and prickly lettuce. So I just, I've put up some data on prickly lettuce in faba beans and it's just uh, prickly lettuce plants at 99 days after application. And so in the untreated, we have a significant number of uh, prickly lettuce plants. And what I wanted to highlight here was 180 grams of terrain on its own in this trial, suppressed prickly lettuce plant numbers, 860 grams of terbuthylazine poso pre-emergent suppressed prickly uh, lettuce plant numbers, but in combination, the two, so terrain IBS, terbuthylazine poso pre-emergent did an excellent job of controlling prickly lettuce. So um, it's just a great example of what I mean about um, a strong residual spike um, that complements other herbicides very nicely. Um, I, I guess it, I've only been able to briefly touch on, on the two products and the group Gs. If you do have more questions about how they fit in with your seeding system or soil type, I would strongly encourage you to call a new farm rep or a Syngenta rep and have further discussions on that. Uh, next slide, please, Claire. So one more. Um, Tony touched on grass herbicides and, and the groups available. Uh, Adama is going to be releasing Ultro uh, next year. So this is, uh, the active ingredient is carbetamide. Uh, it's a new mode of action. So group E, um, carbetamine's mainly absorbed by the roots and will be registered in um, all those pulse crops you can see listed there and provides excellent control of annual rye, rye grass, brome grass, barley grass, and even provides suppression of, of wild oats. Um, and so why is this important? So we've got a new mode of action here, a, a group E. Um, and while we don't have currently have resistance to propizamide in broad acre cropping situations, we've, we've now got an option of mixing and rotating our, our herbicides group, our herbicide groups with, with carbetamide. Um, so next slide, please, Claire. And so what you might see is some ryegrass can get through, but um, what you see here is pruning of the roots by carbetamide. So uh, the, the, the root system is virtually non-existent. So uh, by the end of the year, um, these essentially will die and be unable to throw up any seed heads. So that's um, being available next year, 2021. And again, I would, if you want to learn more about that, I would encourage you to call your Adama representative. So I think that covers us today, Claire, and I reckon we'd, we're just on time and we might have time for a few questions if there's any in the chat box. Thank you very much, Tony and Dave. That was, uh, yeah, fantastic. So if you would like to ask a question, please um, type that in the, the Q&A box. Um, one did come in a couple minutes ago. It was around high trifluralin rates in faber beans. Oh, I don't know if you want to answer that one, Tony. I can say that obviously it's not registered, but faba beans tend to be quite tolerant of trifluralin. Um, and in plot work, I've seen it tolerate uh, higher trifluralin rates. But again, it, it, isn't a, it isn't registered. Tony, did you want to comment on that one? Uh, my understanding is that it is, it, it is quite tolerant. I haven't seen any problems with those high rates. And, uh, and yeah, I um, certainly haven't seen the issues that, we, uh, that we've seen in lentils in the past, uh, where lentils have been a bit more, bit more susceptible. Excellent, thanks guys. Um, does anyone else have a further question? We've got about 18 people on the webinar right now, so surely someone does. I'll just comment on Marty's point about dry sowing. Uh, I think we all know that moisture is so important for optimal performance of herbicides. So um, particularly when soils dry out after seeding, you can get a decreased performance in, in herbicide control. And we see that even with group Gs, even with the group Cs. So, you know, that isn't something that we have control over, um, but it's something to take into account um, if you are seeing a, a reduced performance. Just to add to that, I guess my issue with dry sowing has been increased herbicide damage risk of some products when they, uh, when we do get the rain and the, the herbicide follows the wetting front down, down through the soil. Um, 
So I've, particularly in sandy soils, I get uh, get quite conservative with with rates and also the way we actually actually use the the herbicides in that situation. Sometimes uh, where there's still a prickle chain in the corner of the paddock, that uh, we'll go out with a, a group C um, post sowing pre-emergent after the rainfall event with uh, but after prickle chaining it's to, to fill in the fill in the furrows as well to try and I guess get some get some reasonable level of activity without uh, without hopefully increasing the, the damage risk. So so yeah changing the use pattern in dry sowing does have a it does have a um, a, a safety benefit as well. Thanks Tony. Another question's just popped in. Uh, trying to control toad rush in pulses with pre-emergence. I'm just, hmm. <laughs> oh, so I, the best option there would probably be box of gold as we know the esmetolophore yep. component would um, have activity on, on toad rush. I'd agree. I was thinking, thinking dual gold, and then thinking where, uh, where the registration sits, which is probably. Uh, I don't think exclusive. there is. Yeah, I don't no. think there is one. No, I'd agree. Uh, one more question in the Q and A box: the the best preem mix for by Fora and the rough control percentage. Depends what crop. It depends what crop. Um, I'd I'd put um, uh, in in beans and peas probably probably a spinnaker a spinnaker mix would be the the my choice in terms of of um, of uh, the best suited product. I'd still call it suppression though rather than control. If you look at um, Look at bifora plants that have been treated with uh, with spinnaker. You'll often see they'll still still um, uh, still germinate and uh, grow, but the, the the length, the height of the plant will be ten percent of the non-treated plants. So so yeah, I'd probably put spinnaker up there in terms of the better suppressive uh, product on uh, on bifora in the right crop. And I'll just comment that uh, terrain will suppress, again, it's only suppressing numbers of bifora, um, but I do believe that reflex as well has significant activity on bifora. So both of those, perhaps in combination uh, with spinnaker, uh, would be a useful option. Yep, definitely the new chemistry offers, offers some more, uh, more scope there for bifora control or suppression. Uh, Gus Cord has just corrected us and has mentioned that Sakura is also an option for toad rush, um, given it has those uh, that pulse registrations. Yes, thanks for that, Dave. I was about to read that. <laughs> an option for toad rush in lentils, field peas, chickpeas, and lupins. Uh, and Dyeron possibly also has toad rush activity on toad rush. Uh, someone thinks there. Uh, another question: How far off a metribuzin lentils are we? That's a very good question. I ask the same one, and uh, I think every time I pose that question, the the response is five years. But I think I've been hearing that for three years now. So, uh, and there is a couple of aspects to that. One is one is to uh, to I guess produce uh, the the right varieties, but we're going to. There will be some registration and uh, issues as well that uh, that we that that, that hoops that will need to be jumped through before we can commercially use it. So, uh, so yeah, I, I my my mail says at least five years. Any other um, last minute questions? We've had some good discussion so far. Um, okay, well, we might nearly, um, 
yeah, wrap it up there. Thank you very much, uh, Tony and Dave. That's been fantastic. If anyone is looking for any further information on pulses, um, the GRDC Grow Notes are a very comprehensive resource. Also, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project has a number of activities occurring during 2020 to bring you all the latest information. There is a network of discussion groups operating across Victoria and South Australia for existing and new pulse growers. So if you have any suggestions or requests for things that you'd like to learn about pulses, please let myself know and I will put you in touch with the local facilitator. Uh, the best bet is my email address, which is claire at bcg.org.au. Also, keep an eye out for future webinars. They are a monthly during the growing season. So get in touch with myself if you'd like to be added to the distribution list. Uh, thank you very much, Tony and David, for a great presentation. Thank you. Comments thank you, Claire. Rolling in saying that it's that it's been great. So good job. Uh, once everyone, you all leave the webinar, you will be redirected to a screen with a quick survey link. It has five short questions. It should take you no more than a minute just to see how you found today and so we can keep improving our future webinars. If you fill that out, it would be very much appreciated. Again, if you'd like to be kept in the loop of all these webinars, please contact myself and I will add you to the list. Again, my email is claire, C-L-A-I-R-E at pcg.org.au. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Tony.